Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, maybe we have to go ahead and match. Okay, so, so for the last week, uh, I was confused about the time because I was thinking maybe we are, since we were changing the time, we'll be moving back by one hour. No, no, we are adding extra uh, one hour. So let me just put stats in the charts. So for the benefit of uh, those uh, that will be pulling along, uh, with our discussion on YouTube that uh, this is the Alpha Data Science uh, Online Learning uh, Community. And today, uh, as we are going through the Mastering Shiny book today, I'll be looking at, uh, we'll be discussing on chapter five, uh, which is about uh, workflow. Uh, first of all, I think uh, the book, uh, the first of all starts uh, uh, with this uh, mot motivation from the Hadley, that uh, one thing, one of the uh, secret powers uh, that have let him improve over the years in writing apps is that he developed a lot of time in improving his workflow. And he also encouraged us that we should spend more time in, in trying to see how we can improve our workflow because it's going to what improve uh, the process in which we are going to follow when uh, we are uh, developing apps. So he said we should spend more time in our workflow. So like uh, for the learning objective uh, for today, so we are going to, the goals of this chapter is to help improve three important shiny workflows. So first, we are going to learn the de development, the basic development cycle for creating apps, uh, making changes and quickly experiment uh, with the results. Uh, we are also going to learn about uh, how to debug shiny apps. Uh, we are also going to learn how to write uh, self-contained uh, reprints. So the, the, there is this uh, tree diagram which we look at where we have we have the workflow which the first part is talking about uh, the development cycle where we create an app, we make changes to the app, and we experiment uh, quickly. Experimenting means that we experiment with the app, how the app looks, we quickly, then we stop the app, then we go back to write our code. The second tree here is for debugging, okay? Because in the, in the process of creating uh, our shiny app, something, something is going to go wrong. We expect that something is going to go wrong. So if those, something goes wrong, so how do, we, how do we troubleshoot it? So debugging means what has gone wrong and how do we how do we fix uh, that problem? So that is what uh, this part is talking about. So the, the third part in the tree is that maybe we discover something has gone wrong. We do not know how to fix that problem. So we are going to learn how to write uh, how to write a good reflex, which is like a reproducible example, in which we can post in forum like Slack, Stack Overflow, uh, or our studio community. So that is, just like a summary of what we'll be looking at today in our discussion. So, but please uh, do feel free to stop me at any point. Maybe there is something that is not clear so that I can come back uh, to it. So like for the development workflow, okay? So you say allow you, allow us to reduce the time between making a change and seeing the outcome. The faster, because the faster we can iterate, experiment and faster we become a better uh, developer. So uh, the, the book, first of all, talking about creating apps for the first time, making changes and experimenting with the result, speeding up the iteration uh, cycle. Okay, 
So this part it talks about that how do we create apps? Because they believe that every app that we are going to be writing is going to contain these first uh, six lines of code. So, it, but it's going to be very, uh, it's going to be uh, very tedious for us to be writing these same six lines of code every time we want to create our app. So, but going to our studio, uh, there is a keyboard shortcut which is Shift uh, plus Tab. So, once I switch back to our studio, then I open my scripts. Okay, so when we just type shiny, shiny app, library shiny. Okay, so when I type shiny, shiny app, then I say shift plus tab is, sorry, shiny, shiny app. It's a shift, uh, shiny app. Then, shiny app. So once I hit uh, this, it's going to give me the snippets, the keyboard, the, the snippet, which is going to give me uh, the, the same six lines of code, which is library shiny, which is an initializing the app. This is just defining the UI component. This is defining the server. And this is also, this is starting, it's going to initialize uh, the Shiny app. So once we run this, uh -huh, control plus enter, so we can see that this initialize uh, the Shiny app. Then alternatively, alternatively, we can also go to the, to the click on this tab, click on new project. Sorry, the app is, I need to stop the app. I need to stop this. Yes. Okay, so once we click on this, okay, we click on new projects. Okay, so we click on new, uh, new directory, so we shiny web application. So we just give it a name, we give it uh, the location where we want to drop the app, and we just click on create app. So it's going to create uh, the app so the but there is also another approach where uh, uh we can click on click on uh i think uh, shiny web application okay we give it a name so this one is single file for which has both the ui and server but at times you might want to create a very big app then we can choose to uh switch component whereby we place the UI in a separate file and also split uh, the server separately. But I think this book, we do not go into that uh, discussion yet. We have not reached that part yet for the, the discussion. So this is just the shortcut. So we have file, new project, new directory, shiny web application, which is going to do the same thing. This one is a keyboard shortcut, shift plus tab. So maybe in the year they talk about seeing, seeing changes, seeing your changes are faster because every time we are going to be, as we are writing our app, we need to see how uh, how these changes uh, uh, occur in the app. So the best part of it, uh, because by default, the, the book, they kind of advise that we should avoid always clicking the run app or rather, in order for us to speed up our workflow, we should and they, they do encourage that we should we should uh, we should as much as try as much as possible to use uh, the keyboard shortcut. So here we have an example whereby we are writing the app. So we when we are on Windows, we can use Control plus Shift plus Enter to initialize the app. 
But when we are on Mac, we will be using command plus shift plus enter. So uh, because we use that uh, to start the app so that we can initially experiment with the app to see how the app is look is, is going to, is is looking. Then if we are satisfied, we just stop the app. Then we go back to our step one to keep on uh, writing our code. Okay. So the second part in which they also discuss, they talk about we can also we can also turn on auto reload. Okay, we can set auto reload, turn it to true, whereby each time we are writing the app, we are saving the app. We mix, we just save anything we write, we just save it, then uh, we see instance uh, updates in the app. But uh, this they do uh, the drawback of this process is is that uh, they do discuss that since this app we are creating uh, is running in a separate uh, process, so it becomes very difficult for us to troubleshoot this app maybe when we run into problems. So let's see that for an example. So the first one, uh, for us to see change faster, rather than we clicking, rather than we clicking on the run app in our studio, or we can just use uh, the keyboard uh, shortcut, which is we, we can just align control shift plus enter to run to initialize the app. So this is uh, the app. So we can see that with, with this process, we can just look at in our studio how the app is going to look. If, if we are satisfied with everything, we can just stop the app and we go back uh, to our step one to keep on with our process of writing our normal output. So, but the second one talking about uh, running the app in a background job, okay? So, but in order for us to do that, we need to also have a separate script where we are going to set up the options. Uh, we are going to also say shiny or auto reload, we set it to true. Then this second line, this is what is going to start, uh, this is what is going to start the shiny app. So for how do we do that? So we need to go to background jobs. So click on the background job. We need to click on start background job. Okay. So start background job. So here we need to pass in the file, the leading our shiny run app. This is this is the house scripts that is going to run the app. Then this is our working directory. Okay, so this is our working directory. Then if we are true, we, we can just click on start. Let me start. We can browse this in my directories. This is what I'm looking for, shiny run app. I select that. Then this is my default directory, which is this directory we are working on. Then we click on start the job. So once I click on start the job, it, can, it will just show that listening on this spot. Okay. It's going to show listening on this spot. So I'll simply go back to my console. I'll copy this. Okay, go back to my R Studio. API. I think we have view URL. Then I pass in this URL as a screen. Okay, so once I pass in that URL at the screen, so it's going to initialize uh, the, this app for me. It's going to initialize this app, and this is the source code I'm using to run that app. Okay, it's going to initialize this app. So maybe I, let me say I comment out the title. Remember here we have viewer. I comment out that title, the old faithful player. Then if I should do save this, okay, we can see that we do not have uh, the title there again. If I should un uncomment the title and save it, we can see that we now have uh, that title. Okay, so, but the drawback for this uh, process is that what they discuss in the book is that the drawback for this process is that this app is running in another separate uh, process, okay? Different from our normal app session. 
because as this app get bigger and bigger, things become complicated for us to what debug for us to troubleshoot. Okay, because the app is running a separate process. So each time we just do any changes in the script, okay, we make one change in the script, uh, we save that changes. We are going to have instant updates in the app. It's just going to update that app instantly. We are going to see instant updates. But if something we have a bug, it becomes very difficult for us uh, to to debug uh, to debug the app to know where uh, the pro problem is coming from. So I will just stop the job. I'll stop the job. I don't know if there are any questions. Yeah, so, uh, the question. Okay. Uh, how do you link that add to the background process in the how, how do you refer in the wrong shiny shiny and the shiny shiny file? It's not any reference. Yes, yes, there is no reference. Automatically, the app is going to be know that since shiny uh ways the code again. Okay, we have option shiny auto reload is set to true. Okay, we have shiny run app. So by default, it is going to look at the directory since I already tell the app that I'm running it from this directory. So it's going to look for this app.r script. So the app is running the app. Uh, okay, so it's running this app.r script because it's going to reference the app.r script because the app.r script is what is going to initialize uh is going to that is the first script is going to look at so whatever is inside the app.r script that is what uh the background job is going to use in that process okay great uh so let if there are no questions i should just stop this okay and we can continue. Uh, I have a question. Uh, okay. could, could you define what is a background job? Okay, so background background job, from my own understanding, you know, we have our normal console. Okay, background job is something that is running behind the skin, in which we are not seeing, is not what we use. Is not running like our normal session. This one is running at the back behind the skin because you have initialized another process that is running behind the skin. So we are we are just writing our normal code. Okay, we have another script that is running behind the skin. We have initialized another script that is running behind the skin. The skin is in such a way that we make one changes in our normal code in which we are running. So we just see that instant changes, it updates the app automatically. We see the instant update because if it's, we say start background job, we can see that we we, we, we define this script, this shiny, run, shiny iPhone run.r, which, which is what we define here. Then we set the working directory where we want, where we want to run our background job. In this case, I said this, I'm using my this as my working directory. Run job with copy of global environments. We can choose to set this. When we set this, means that it's going to grab everything we have in our local environment. But in my own case, I I did not check that. Then we start that job. So whatever we are doing in this app.r script, because this is the first script is going to pick, because it believes that is what uh, Shiny uses to start the app. So whatever script we put here, so that that is what is going to be run uh, in the background job. Because in this Shiny run.app, we can also de define the directory here in our code, in our line three. We can see that we can define the direct the application to run. We can define a directory here. Since I already specify in the run app that we am using this i'm using this as my default directory so it's going to look for this script but if i 
I find I place this script in another folder, then I can come here to the run.app, then I define the directory where I want to start that app from. I can, so that each time I save my script, it's going to just locate, oh, we have an app.r in another separate directory. So that is where the app is going to look for our app.r, then it's going to use it to start the app. So I don't know if I'm able to answer your question. Uh, uh, very right. Very good. I guess um, I'm, what I'm hung up on is uh, uh, is a background job simply just another R session, and in principle, we could have two, three, ten R sessions at once doing different things. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank. That's it. Thank you. Okay, so here I think they were talking about uh, the disadvantage of this, that once this app gets bigger, interactive testing, automated testing, uh, it becomes very difficult uh, for us to troubleshoot uh, the app because, as I have already mentioned, that uh, because the app is running uh, in a separate, in a separate uh, process. So the next step, the next part of the book, uh, they were talking about controlling the view. So by default, each time we initialize this app, okay, each time we start the app, the app is going to run in a in a win in a separate window. Our shiny app is going to start in a separate window, but we can also choose to start the app in our R Studio viewer pane. We can also choose to run the app uh, in our external browser. And this one is very useful for larger apps, for bigger apps, so that we can see what is going on in the app. Why in our normal house to have viewer pane, maybe for smaller apps, but when we have a bigger app, it's better we always run it in our external uh, browser. So once we come here to our studio, this is the run app. We can see there is a drop down here. Once we click it, we can see running windows, okay? which is going to pop the app up. We can see running viewer pane, which is going to start the app in the R Studio viewer pane. We can see run external. This one is going to start uh, the app in our normal external uh, browser. Okay, so go back to here. Okay, so this one, is Mainly, this part mainly talk about uh, debugging because in the process of creating a shiny app, something will always go wrong. If something do go wrong, how do we how do we how do we uh, troubleshoot it in order for us to fix it? So, only first of all, start here that it, yeah, it's a eight line app. What is what has gone wrong? Okay, but the process is talk about the process of systematically comparing your expectations or reality until you find a mismatch. So something will definitely go wrong when we are creating an app. So it, but it, because he also said that it takes years of experience uh, to write code that works uh, the first time. So we need a robust workflow for identifying and fixing mistakes. So specific focus on the three debugging challenges in Shiny App. So that is what we are going to look at. And looking at the three debugging challenges, you get an unexpected error, which is the simplest. We are going to you get a trace back, and we are going to use uh, the interactive uh, debugger in order for us to, uh, to troubleshoot to see how we can fix that problem. The second part is that you don't get any error. We can we we'll still use the interactive debugger alongside with our own investigative uh, skill. While the last part, which is the hardest. Everything is correct, but the, the but no update, which is the hardest part in Shiny App. Yeah, our debugging skill uh, cannot help us there. So we are going to see how we are going to write uh, self-contained uh, reprex, which is a reproducible example where we can use to uh, seek for help. So yeah, they talk about you get an unexpected error, which is a, a trace back is returned, which is an information that points to where the error occurred. 
Yeah, the interactive debugger is a powerful assistant for this uh, process. So the second part is we don't get any error. Use interactive debugger, it tools to investigate or track down uh, the cause. The, the last part, all values are correct, but they are not updated when you expect, which is the most challenging problem. It is uh, unique to Shiny. You cannot take advantage of an existing um, uh, debugging skills here because here we need to seek for help because this is beyond us for now. We need to seek for help. So the first part is fixing errors with trace back. Okay. Fixing errors with trace back in, in our every error is accompanied by a trace back or call stack, which literally traces back through the sequence of calls that lead to the error. The functions are printed in reverse order. They trace back to pinpoint to the location of an error. So here we have this is a uh, a trace a call stack, okay which is the main call, this one call, the first call, the second call, the third call, and the fourth call. So but then basically we need to what flip, flip this call. So we have an example of, of reading a trace back. We have F, which is a function that reference G of X. Then we have G, which is also a function where we have H of X. We have H, which is another function uh, that we run the multiplication of operation. So we now have f of three, which is going to give us four. Okay, f of three, which is going to give us uh, four. So now we have another function. This is another function. Okay, this is another function, which is x times two. So when we now test this function with f of a, this will generate an error f of a and it returns this error in x times two non-numeric argument so binary uh, operator then if it if it prints run trace back okay we can see the trace back which shows us the sequence of call that leads to the error here we have we have in this is our call f of a which reference g of x which reference h of x remember this is the function that we define. We started from F, F reference G, G call also H. Okay, so this now shows off the sequence of call, but when we flip this call, when we flip this call, because it's always advisable, we flip the call upside down. So this is a call, the last call, F of A. So this call is going to call this function and it's going to call this function. So this is going to just show us the sequence of call that that function is going to make that. So we can use this uh, to know uh, which one is going to be uh, the most offending function that is uh, going to lead us to where we are having this error. So but uh, doing this in Shiny is that, Shiny is a different thing entirely, is that we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, run traceback in Shiny. But what Shiny does is that once we start the app, Shiny is just going to print the traceback to our console. We, we are going to see uh, the traceback. We are going to get see the traceback in our R console. So let's see that traceback, okay? Let's see that. So we have this function. We have this other function. We have this other function. This this is starting the Shiny app. This is the UI. This is the server. So once I start this app, once I start this app, okay, it's just going to show us error, non-numeric argument to binary operator. Then it's going to send, it's going to send uh, the trace back to our, our R console. It's just going to print, send the trace back to our R console which it shows G, it shows us this, it shows us this. So this is showing uh, the sequence of four. Remember this uh, is one, this is what is starting, this is starting the shiny app. Then this is our reactive call because we have output dollar sign plots, which is what is going to start 
uh, the our plot, which is reactive. So we can suspect this is the most offending. Uh, this is the offending function because we have output dollar sign plot, we have render plot. Remember, we have f input dollar sign n. Okay, so this we can suspect that the the offending function is here because already it shows us that we have non numeric arguments to binary operator because uh, this is we need to wrap this uh, with the as dot a numeric function in order for it to understand that this it should be numeric. That is why we are getting this error non numeric argument to binary operator so that we can know how we are going to fix uh, that problem. So here is just a summary of uh, what I've done already talked about, but I will still go through it, that we cannot run traceback while Shiny is running. So we're starting the Shiny app. Okay, this is the function in which I've already showed us. Okay, this is, we define the UI, we define the server, we start the Shiny app. So when we start the Shiny app, we are going to, it's going to kick out this error is going to be printed in our our console. But when we flip that call upside down, we can see that this is starting this shiny app. This we have outputs dollar sign plots, uh, which is a reactive call, which shows uh, this other one, they are just specific to shiny. So this other line is telling us that this line, uh, this is our normal R code in which uh, we have written because we can see this is our upload alpha. Okay, I don't know if there are any questions up till now. Okay, so maybe I, I go ahead, but in case there are any questions, so please feel free to interrupt me. Okay, yo, here is talking about uh, the three components to a shiny error start. So the first few calls starts the app, ignore everything before it. Okay, so we already know that, but we click on run app. But when we source the app, we are going to get a different error because when we source, we are going to have print shiny objects and this. But when we are using a shiny run app, this is what we are going to have. This is what we are going to see in our app. Because the third, this is mainly what is, this is not mainly our normal R code in which we have written. So this is the, this is where the offending function is because this is how relates to our normal reactive code in Shiny. So this part talk about fixing errors, how we can use the interactive uh, debugger. Okay. We so first of all is we talk about identify the error using traceback and want to figure out what is causing it. So here we are going to be using the interactive debugger. So which is like only making a call to a browser, and this browser there are two ways in which we can put this browser. We can use uh, we can also use the an if condition to to kick the browser. So here we have input dollar sign value is equals to A, which is character, then draws through the browser. Or if my reactive is less than zero, take us uh, to the browser. So let's see how we can do this in Chinese. So here I have a data frame. Okay. This, this data frame, we can see that I have some missing value. Okay, I define the UI, okay, in my server. I make a call to the browser, which is going to kick, kick out my interactive console where I can experiment to see what is going to happen, in, what is happening in my app. Then when I start the app, automatically, once I start the app, this, it take it fire up, it takes us to the browser, we can see. It locates the line three. It, it highlight line three. That is where the browser starts from. Okay. So now this is my reactive console. Okay. In this case, I can I can choose I can now interact 
uh, with my output. So what I do here, since I have that, I can say head of that. Okay, so we can see that uh, this, the head of that, I can inspect that data. We can see that here we have some missing data in this data, that is why, that is why, uh, that is why the summary is not showing out in that output. So I can now say is for for sums is dot and that's so we can see that yeah, uh, we have we have one, we have one, we have two, two missing two missing data in that. So we can, once we have satisfied, we know uh, we know where uh, the problem is coming. We can choose, we can choose to click on next, which would, which would take us to the next line in that call. We can see that here, the summary outputs we are getting, uh, we are still getting any in that summary output because if we look at the dots, here, yeah. if you look at the dots, here yeah, we have main dots. We need to put n.rm to be true. We need to set it to be true. So we run this again. It's still going to take us uh, to the reactive. It's still going to fire the reactive console for us to check uh, that everything is working fine. Then I, if I am satisfied, I can run next it will it will take us to the next line in that call if i'm satisfied i can just say continue which will run my app and uh and i select lesson the app is still any victor is still any okay i need to save this run this run this sorry Run the app again. Run. So I say continue. We'll step to the next line. We are still getting any any why. I think you have an data saver. Let's see. 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 let we save the server object. Okay, okay, okay. The server object is set now. Continues running the app. Warning. Is returning a warning here? Oh, oh, oh. It's an argument is not numerical or returning any. Okay. Let's say ask what numeric graphics here. So it starts the app. Continue up, we get a new different error.
uh, go up because yeah, this this is weird. <laughs> <laughs> go up okay. to see how do you define the 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 data structure because that's I think it's a vector, right? Yes. Uh... So you have no a data frame. So yeah, you have a data frame. And you need to get the, the, the vector from the data frame to, to apply the mean. Yeah. That, the yeah, dollar sign, wait. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yeah, that. Yes. And now, uh, uh, NA remove also. Oh, okay. You 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 will get the num. You don't have. Yeah, all of them include the na dot rm. Yes. That should be okay. I hope. <laughs> Let's see. Continue. Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> So now we can now see that that is now uh, the main. Thank you very much. I did not. So the next, uh, the next, the next useful interactive debugger command. So we can we have seen. Uh, we can press next, step into the next function. Okay. We can also press C, which leaves the debugger continues the regular execution of the function. We can choose to also use Q, which stops debugging, terminates the function, and returns to global, to our own normal global uh, workspace. So, so those are one of the useful debugging techniques. We have seen how to use browser. Uh, there is also the breakpoints whereby, uh, and the whereby we can just go to any line here. So, uh, we can go to any of the lines. Okay, so we can just double click any of, uh, we can just go to the line, click on debug. But here yeah, it's not popping up and it's, it's not popular stats debugging, local breakpoints. We need to just click on any line there. It's supposed to show a break. I don't know what is happening. You're in, the, you're in the server chip right on our script. I think you go to our script, that will work. Yes. After R. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. I don't know why it's highlighting. Normally, if I just come here, I highlight any line, it's supposed to insert breakpoints. No, because maybe that's a starting of the function. Maybe you go to a plot, maybe 23 or history. Maybe you click double click over that line because I know the, yeah, the, no, it's not, it's not, no? not <laughs> so maybe because of time. So normally it's supposed to just, let me just talk about the function is that it's going to just put a red dot there means that anytime we run the line at that point, it's still going to take us to our interactive debugger whereby we can use to experiment to see what is going wrong out in our code. So we can step into each line and see how the code is going to work. So that in that case, we can see, oh, this is where we are. We made error when we are writing our code. We can step back and fix it, then we continue uh, execution of our output. The great part of this is that this is normal. Not uh, we cannot. We 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 don't need to come back to our code to man manually delete it because that is not normally our code. So because using browser at times we need to go back to the script to delete uh, the browser. Once we have seen uh, where we are having issue in, we can go back there just remove the browser once we have fixed the issue. But using the breakpoints, we don't need to go back. So because we can push our code back to our GitHub repository, even with the breakpoints still there in our script, there's uh, no problem about that. But in the browser, we need to go back to delete 
uh, that browser call as from our output. So the next, uh, they talk here. Yeah, they talk about debugging uh, reactivity, which is the hardest problem to debug. We need other tools which are not introduced in this chapter. Okay, we are, we are also going to use print debugging to show values. We are also use message here to standard output the source uh, the standard uh, error because they said the reactivity is very is the most hardest hardest part. So so now looking at the three debugging workflow, we can see that the development cycle in uh, creating an app. We create app, we make changes, we experiment uh, quickly with our app. Then when we have issues, so how do we debug issue? What is gone wrong? How do we fix it? But there are some time whereby we are here, we cannot fix uh, the problem. So the next part now we need to look, we need to seek for help. And in order for us uh, to seek for help, we need to learn how to write uh, good uh, rubrics. So which is what we are going to look at next. And writing, writing good reprints, writing good reprints. If you can debug the error, it is time to ask for help in Shiny community by creating a reprints. A reprints is just some R code that works when you copy and paste it in our normal R session on another computer. So good reprints make it easy for others to help debug the app. Below is an example of a reprints. Okay. So how to make a reprex, we create a single self-contained file that contains everything needed to run your code. So example, load all the packages. So we also test if by restarting fresh out session and then running, running the code. So we can also have potential problem in sharing data. So we, first of all, we need to, uh, we have my data, my data, yeah, if they are using just a toy data, but we can also use uh, the deput function, which is going to give us a skeletal structure of our data in which we want. We can just say deput, my data will give us the structure uh, of that data. Or we can we can also post this app in GitHub, share the GitHub repo, or we share the app as a zip file, okay? We make use of, uh, they also advise we should make use of relative parts rather than absolute parts. Because if you we are if we are using absolute parts, another pe person that wants to it might not be able to reproduce our problem because they need to correct it. So, but we need to the advice we use the relative parts rather than absolute parts. Uh, we format our code to force for readability by using the styler package. So make, making a minimal minimal reprex, we have to trim out code that is okay to make life is much easier rather than forcing a potential helper to understand your entire app. This process uh, here they make you some an example of an app, example of a good reprex. I think we have Shiny. Okay, here they define uh, the UI part of the app. Okay. Here they also they define the server of a shiny app. Uh, here the data was supposed to be defined above. So here the person defined the data here. Here we have time series. We have some print statements. Uh, it has some reactive calls here. So we can see that uh, this app it's very difficult uh, to read because this other one, the person did not even load almost all the tools needed. He did not format the code using the styler package. Okay. So making this bad reprex uh, better. So here we can see that all the packages needed to start the app was loaded. Okay. The, the UI was properly defined. The server function was also defined. Okay. Remove the remove parts of the code that is independent uh, with the error. New new server calls are reduced. So I think uh, and and one of the beauty is that uh, with with our studio is 
using the the reflex uh using the reflex package uh we can easily we can easily use uh the uh the reflex uh package uh to create a reflex so yeah i have an example the same code okay library shine xts will be dead shiny then this this is for the the ui this is also the server code okay so i can just highlight uh i can just highlight this code go to my add-in okay then i type reflex to search for the reflex okay so here I said render reflex, okay, which is going to start the adding uh, for, to the reflex. So now I choose this current selection. So because I've highlighted the, the entire code I want to use for my, I say current selection. Here is asking for target venue. Where do I want to put? Is it GitHub or Stack Overflow? Okay, is it Slack messages? So let's say, for example, I want to post this reflex in Slack. So I click on Slack. Then, if I'm true, then I, if I'm true, I click on Slack. I will just click on Render Reflex, which is going to render the entire reflex for me. It's going to render the reflex. This is now the reflex. I think it's still also, and it, it has style. It is still also in my clipboard where I can just open a new house script. Okay, then I paste it there. We can see that this is the entire, this is the entire reflex that we have seen is still in my clipboard. Here is the error trying to find, and it's very easy. You can now take this and now post uh, in the venue in Slack to show that. Uh... Okay, I think uh, that is all I got today in the chapter. I don't know if there are any questions. No. No, it's okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Let me 